um, Jason Fairbanks and the death of Elizabeth Fails. And generally, you'll see anything about this as Jason Fairbanks, the murderer of Elizabeth Fails. But what I was kind of saying about me being like lenient, because I don't really know another word for it, is that I think it's the alleged murder of Elizabeth Fails. Um, I maintain that if he was tried in 2019, he would not have been convicted. I think there was reasonable doubt. Um, but I'll let you guys know about what happened. I'm going to give you a lot of details on the court case, and you can make your own decisions about that. So, right now, so Jason Fairbanks. I'll try to remember what I wrote. <laughs> All right, so the house, the Fairbanks house, as people know, is built by Jonathan and Grace Fairbanks. It goes to their son John, John's son Joseph, Joseph's son Joseph, Joseph's son Joseph. It's not very unique right then. Joseph sells it to his younger brother, Ebenezer. So Ebenezer Jr. is Jason's brother. Ebenezer Sr. is his father. So this little white bracket here just shows this is the time period we're talking about. So this is in the time when Ebenezer uh, owned the house. Ebenezer Jr., this is around the time when the east wing, uh, the entire east wing of the house was a building somewhere else on the property and it was brought over and attached to the Fairbanks house for Ebenezer Jr. and his family to live in. So there's basically two families living in the house at this point because Ebenezer Sr. still has a few kids at home and Ebenezer Jr. is old enough that he has a wife and several children. So, Jason Fairbanks is born in 1780. So when this all happens, he's not yet 21. He's about to turn 21. When he was a small child, he was vaccinated, or not a small child, but he was eight or nine years old. He was vaccinated for smallpox, uh, but he actually caught smallpox from the vaccination. Um, and at that time, smallpox was treated with mercury, which we now know is a terrible idea, but back then, that's what they did. Um, it caused him to have a weak constitution. He was often sick and he had a withered right arm that was unable to move at all uh, from, he wasn't at all able to move his elbow down to his wrist. Um, the entire arm was, was stiff and unmovable. So in 1801 in Dedham, the Fairbanks are prominent citizens. Oh, a lot gets cut off there. Ooh, okay. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> the Fairbanks are prominent citizens in Dedham. Uh, they have a long established line in the town. They, Jonathan Fairbanks, who built the house, was the first person invited to live in the town after the founders. So he wasn't a founder of Dedham, he was literally the next one in. At this time, the house has 10, 12 to 15 family members living there. But the Fairbanks family is already suffering a little bit of a reputation problem because of Benjamin Fairbanks, who is Jason's uncle. So at the time, so a few years previous to this issue with Jason, um, John Adams is president and passes the Sedition Acts, which basically make it illegal to talk badly about the government, which we all might notice is a vast, you know, terrible idea with the whole First Amendment conflict there. But John Adams did it. And uh, of course, the next president, um, Jefferson immediately, his first act was to get rid of those and immediately pardon everyone who'd been uh, imprisoned under the Sedition Acts. But Benjamin Fairbanks and a friend of his, um, and Dan can remind me, what, they they put up a sign, right, about... Yeah, they put up a flag off of the Liberty Pole in town saying, down with John Adams. Okay, so a flag the on the Liberty President. Pole in town saying, down with John Adams, which definitely counted as sedition. So, um, they get arrested for that. Now, Benjamin Fairbanks is a Fairbanks. They are a wealthy family and they're well known. And Benjamin's friend is a nobody. And Benjamin's friend gets the heaviest penalty ever given to someone arrested under the Sedition Acts. And Benjamin Fairbanks gets the lightest sentence of anyone ever given under the Sedition Acts. Um, so I believe Benjamin's friend is sentenced to like 30 years in prison and like a $500 fine, and Benjamin Fairbanks gets like a $50 fine and six hours in jail. So there was already some hard feeling uh, that perhaps being a Fairbanks had let him get away with more than he would have otherwise. 
So just going into this whole issue with Jason, you keep in mind, this is speculation, but we knew there was some hard feeling toward the Fairbanks family already for kind of getting away with things. Um, the Fales family originally came over as uh, servants. Um, the original Fales came from England with Jonathan and Grace Fairbanks as one of their servants. But at this point, they're their own line. It was an, he was an indentured servant, but you know his indentured servitude ended in that first Fales lifetime, and the Fales become their own prominent, well-known family. They're not quite as well off as the Fairbanks, but they're comfortable. Um, the Fales property, so this right here, what says Willow Street, that's now East Street, Eastern Ave, excuse me, connected with East Street. So this is where the Fairbanks house is right now. And you see here, W Fails. So the Fails property is right there. This right here is Endicott. So the house actually on East Street that is all burned out, there was a fire there like a decade ago, um, that actually was the Fails property. That wasn't the Fails house, but that was the Fails property, um, which is just another reason why I would, I would love to see something done with that property. But. <laughs> so, here are the facts that we know. Jason and Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth is referred to uh, by her peers, by her friends and family as Betsy. And I do go back and forth a little bit, but Elizabeth, Betsy, same person, who was 18 years old, were both in William Mason's field on Monday, May 18th. Around 3 p.m., Jason arrives at the Fales residence badly wounded. Betsy is still in the field. She is mortally wounded and dies within minutes of witnesses arriving. Jason is arrested for the murder, tried, convicted, and hanged. And what, what was that asterisk? Uh, there was something down there. I put an asterisk and it was it's cut off. That's an interesting question. The difference between being hanged and someone being hanged. hanged. And hung. Oh, yes. Hanged. Thank hung. you. Wow. See, this is why I keep him around. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> hanged is actually the correct, uh, what a lot of people don't know, a picture is hung, a person is hanged. Uh, they are actually different. So Jason being hanged is correct. It's not me misspeaking um, for anyone who's unaware of that. Okay. Before we get into the trial, let me check my notes here. So, first of all, when it comes to the trial and Jason's statements, I want to apologize ahead of time that I switch back and forth a lot on present versus past tense, on first person versus third person, because I'm trying to modernize the language to make it more easily understandable, but these are all first person accounts. So, sometimes I get a little confusing and I apologize in advance for that. Um, going into the trial, Thing, I've skipped over witnesses who are just talking about the things that are everyone agrees on because we don't that's not interesting we don't need to talk about everyone agrees where Elizabeth was found everyone agrees that Elizabeth and Jason were both in good spirits and normal the day before and the morning of and that Elizabeth was always very cheerful um, everyone agrees that Jason was very tired and sickly uh, that Mercury, um, the smallpox as a kid, didn't just wither his right arm. He was always very sickly and ill and unable to do manual labor. He tried to go to school. They sent him to school in Rentham, and even then he got headaches too easily and couldn't stay in school. Um, according to his brother, he was very industrious and wished to be productive, but he couldn't. According to the prosecutors and then the whole public, he wasn't in school or laboring because he lived a life of idle indulgence. So... Um, when uh, it says so-and-so confirms something, uh, you'll see that word in there a lot, basically that's the attorney general or the, the, or the defense, one of the lawyers, asking a question, like asks a leading question basically, and the person agrees to it. Um, so that wasn't, so basically those things aren't usually the witness's words, it's the attorney general's words, you know, did you see this? And the witness says yes. So that's what confirms means there. Um, so again, I've made it modernly translated because 1801 English is a little bit hard to read. Um, so keep in mind that strange idioms and whatnot are my words, not theirs. Um, and I've put in quotation marks things that are quotes, actual quotes. So the trial is presided over by four judges, Francis Dana, Robert T. Payne, Simeon Strong, Thomas John, 
Dawes Jr. The prosecution is Attorney General Honorable James Sullivan. The defense counsel is Harrison G. Otis, who is a relative of founding father James Otis, and John Lowell Jr. There are 12 jurors, all male, because at the time women could not vote, they could not serve in a jury, etc. I know, I'm not sure what the last, uh, oh, all right, well, hopefully I'm not skipping anything too important. The prosecution's opening statement. <coughs> the Attorney General, hereafter referred to as ATTR Jen for brevity, gives a description of Jason, that he has lost the use of his arm, he has been at school more than laboring lads commonly were, even with schooling had lived an indulged and idle life. He was fond of the deceased, even though he, where he thought he wasn't allowed at her father's house, so they met elsewhere. But there's no evidence the deceased wanted to marry him, according to the Attorney General. Basically, I'm just losing my last bullet point on each one. <clears throat> on Saturday, May 16th, and again, this is the Attorney General's statement of what happened, uh, the opening statement. He told two people he was to meet with Elizabeth where he would settle the affair meaning she would consent to go to Rentham to marry him or he would violate her chastity. He had threatened the same before, but always relented later, saying it would be wrong to ruin her character as revenge against her parents. On Sunday, May 17th, he convinced a young woman to create a false document from the town clerk's office purporting to be a certificate of his having uh, published to be married to Elizabeth Fails. So basically, if you wanted to get married back then, the town clerk had to publish it, had to post it. Um, and so the Attorney General claims that he convinced someone to create a false marriage certificate. On Monday morning, he told a man he was going to Mason's pastor to meet Elizabeth. This same man saw Jason on his way there, spoke with him, and Jason told him he would return in an hour and let him know how it all went. And Jason had hired a horse and carriage to go to Rentham that week. So Rentham is where they could have gotten married. They had to go out of town to get married without her parents' permission. So that was the idea is that he would take her to Rentham and they would get married there. Where's Mason's pasture? Well, that's a good question. Um, may, actually, you know what, let me go back to the map. Come on. So Allie, if you yes. exit the presentation, it won't look as pretty, but you'd be able to see all the content. Oh, well, or I guess not, because it's been converted to a Google Doc. Sorry. Yep. Nope. Good try. I know. Yeah, it was no, good, it was a good try. Oh, you could zoom out? No, because it's still cut off at the bottom. No. Yeah. So, Weird. the magnifying glass might. I don't even know how to get back to it. Up at the top where it says present. present. Up at the top where it says present. right. Yeah. Okay. So, we know that Mason's pasture is, and this is brought up later, within sight of the Fales house. Uh, we don't know if that means you can see it well, but it's said to be about 400 yards from the Fales house. And we know that it is down, further down East Street. So it is somewhere between what is now the Endicott Estate and the Rotary. That terrible rotary that all the Amazon trucks get stuck at. Mm. <laughs> so it's somewhere between there. Uh, we originally thought it was at, around where the rotary is, but 400 yards, it must be a little further up. So maybe around where East Street meets Rustcraft Road, possibly. Uh, so that is our supposition, but we don't have the, uh, the proof of that. So, Jason asked several different people, including William Mason, who owned the field, if there would be anyone working in the field that day, and was told no, there would not. Elizabeth Fales was a healthy, cheerful girl, was her usual happy self the 17th and the morning of the 18th. She sang at a meeting the day before, and everything seemed totally fine. She had plans to go to Mrs. Marsh's in the afternoon on the 18th, and before 1 p.m., she went to Mrs. Guild's and stayed till 2. After 3 p.m., just a little after 3 p.m., Elizabeth's mother sees Jason walk up to the Fales residence, covered in blood and holding a bloody knife. So it's the question, what happened between 2 and 3 p.m., obviously? Nehemiah Fales, who is Betsy's father, and Samuel Fales, who is Betsy's uncle, run to Mason's pasture, 
find her alive but severely wounded and barely breathing. Um, I believe the other things said there were found her alive but severely wounded, barely breathing. Um, oh, um, Samuel asked her if she knew what, what did this to her. She indicated, she made signs is in, in the transcript she made signs, whatever that means, that she did know. Nehemiah asked her if she wanted some water and she made signs that she did. Um, so again, we don't know exactly what signs, but she supposedly said she knew who had done this, though she did not indicate anyone specifically. Um, she could not speak because one of her main wounds was her throat being cut very deeply and through the windpipe. So uh, it was unsurprising that she uh, expired a few minutes later. Jason's great coat and pocketbook, which was borrowed from, uh, the pocketbook was borrowed from Ebenezer Jr., were found near her body. Uh, pocketbooks now, obviously, meaning women's purses. Back then, it was a common thing for a gentleman to carry uh, his papers and important documents in. The fake certificate, mentioned earlier, was in pieces by her feet. Her shoes and shawl were off and a few feet from her, but the rest of her clothes were intact, aside from the, the cuts from stab wounds but they were on her. Uh, the knife Jason was holding was borrowed from Mr. Hardy. Betsy's wounds matched the knife and she had been carrying nothing sharp herself, so they must have been caused by the knife. Two young women had heard sounds of distress um, and they had heard them for the space of about 15 minutes around three o'clock and you'll hear their testimony later. Um, and they said they were sure the voice they heard was Betsy's, but they did not go and investigate. The Attorney General gives a speech <clears throat> about the importance of being impartial and what reasonable doubt means in a court case. And it is during this time, but you'll see especially later in closing statements, that the Attorney General is very pleased with the sound of his own voice and is probably someone I would not enjoy having a conversation with because he just seems very full of himself. But he gives a very long speech about how jurors should behave, basically. <clears throat> he says, Jason's words upon arrival at the Fales House cannot be used for or against him, only his appearance and wounds. So this is something that is common at this time. The defendant is not allowed to give a statement in his trial. The prisoner is never given an evidence in his own favor unless some part of the same story is given in evidence by the government against him. So basically, Jason is not allowed to testify at his trial unless the government wanted to use part of that testimony in the prosecution against him. But basically, since they said, well, we don't want to use any of this against you, you can't use it for you. So first up, Dr. Nathaniel Ames, who is the person who owned the Ames house on High Street. Um, so he has the best description of Elizabeth Wounds. And I will say, this: the book is a mostly complete transcript. The, uh, the people at the court case who put it together admit that they didn't get everything. So what we don't have, we don't know. But it's supposedly pretty complete. Elizabeth had... A wound on her neck, that was a very deep one, through the windpipe. Four on her breasts, six in left arm, two in right arm, two in left side, one in left thumb, and one stab wound in her upper central back. So the last two, the left thumb and the stab wound, uh, are very important throughout the trial because they are the only things here that anyone disagrees about. Everyone agrees these were her other wounds but there's a lot of disagreement about the other ones, the last two. He confirms the wound is in fact on her left thumb. He's specifically asked about that. And he confirms it's possible for the back wound to be self-inflicted, that it is physically possible she could stab herself in the back the way the wound was. Samuel Fails, who is Elizabeth's uncle, when Jason showed up at the Fales house, I told my son to hold him till help arrives, and then I went with Nehemiah to Betsy. Nehemiah is Betsy's father. I turned her over, asked if she knew what hurt her. She made signs she did. Nehemiah asked if she wanted water. She said yes. Dr. Jonathan Wild viewed the wounds but did not examine closely. Confirms with certainty the wound is on her right thumb. Nathaniel Liam said it was on her left. 
He says the wounds on her left wrist may have made her unable to use that arm to resist attack. Possibly this is why she had so many wounds, is that she got the wounds on her wrist early on and was unable to use that arm. Samuel fails again, is called up, um, and he is asked to confirm where he saw uh, a wound, whether he saw a wound on her thumb. And he says there was a wound on her left thumb, but it was already wrapped in birch and not bleeding. It was an old wound. Eunice Lewis, the wounds are in the right arm, not the left. The wound is on the right thumb. It's not wrapped, it's freely bleeding. She says, Betsy and Jason were just friends. Uh, oh, and Samuel uh, Fails, excuse me. Samuel Fails also said that he was not aware of any closeness between Betsy and Jason. So this is one of the other things that's quite disagreed about. Were Betsy and Jason in a relationship, or was Jason just obsessed with her, or had she rebuked him? So Fail says no. Eunice Lewis says yes. Dr. Abija Draper says teeth marks on the hand. No one else says anything about this. Ephraim Handy, or one other person says it, but they're the only two. Ephraim Handy lived at the Fairbanks at the time as a servant. He confirms he owned the pen knife, which Jason borrowed the morning of the 18th. Uh, Jason appeared normal and cheerful that morning. He was not aware of any intimacy between Jason and Betsy. And yes, the penknife was already broken. The tip was already broken off. Sarah Fails, Betsy's mother, totally unaware of any attachment for Jason from Betsy. Again, remember, this is the prosecution, so. Polly Fails, Betsy's sister, went to the Fairbanks house with Betsy the previous week. Betsy exhibited familiarity with the house and with Jason. When they came up, rather than knocking on the door, she threw a pebble at a specific window, and then Jason came to the door. So clearly she knew which window was Jason's and to be expected. Um, Polly Fields goes upstairs with Susanna Davis, Suki, who is Jason's niece, uh, but is an adult because Jason's older brother is much older than him, and leaves Betsy and Jason alone together. Never thought Betsy was fond of Jason or that he was courting her, but she was familiar with the house and threw a pebble at his window and they were together for over an hour alone. But it's a little contradictory, it's fun. But anyway, that's one of the many things where, yeah, like, oh no, they weren't fond of each other. Didn't you just finish telling us how they just spent like over an hour alone together when you wouldn't know? Okay. <laughs> Suki, tell story of how the certificate came to be. So this is the story of the much talked about fake marriage certificate. So, if I can get the right page here. According to Suki, she was sitting at her writing desk, and this is the night before, so this is the 17th, and Jason asks Suki to write him something, and she says, what? He says, anything you please, you may write me a certificate. I have not seen one so long, I have forgotten the form. Suki says, whose name should I put in? Jason, any of the pretty Dedham girls. Suki, I will put Betsy Fail's name in. Jason, that will do. And so this was, and Suki's saying that she knew that Jason liked Betsy, so he said, oh, any girl. And she said, oh, I'll put in Betsy, shall I? That type of... She writes this out. Jason takes it and says, ah, Betsy Fail's, that will do. Suki says she'll take it back and burn it, but Jason says no, he wants to keep it. And Suki tells him, all right, but don't let anybody see it. It's technically a forgery of the, you know, she doesn't say this, but it's technically a forgery from the town clerk, so don't let anyone see it. But she confirms when Jason asked about this, it was in a laughing manner. It wasn't serious. He never specifically asked for Betsy's name. But that they were very fond of each other. She knew how fond they were of each other, and that's why she put that name in. Dr. Benjamin Tur Turner, marks on right hand, possibly from teeth. Definite teeth marks below the thumb on the left hand, no injuries on thumb. Betsy's father, he claims he never forbade Jason from coming to the house. Jeremiah Shuttleworth, there's a wound on the left thumb. I mean, that, they literally went through people just asking about the thumb for a long time. Hannah Farrington, around 3 p.m. heard Betsy's voice crying, oh dear, oh dear, those exact words. It was heard two or three times in 10 to 15 minutes and seemed to be sounds of distress. Jason and Betsy were very fond of each other and often spent time at the Farrington's house together. 
Prudence Farrington, sister of Anna Farrington, thought the sounds were laughter. Later knew them to be sounds of distress. She doesn't say if later means later during hearing the sounds or if later means after she knew Betsy had died, so we're not sure. Though Betsy thought Betsy planned on coming to their house, so didn't go to her. So two sisters are walking by. They hear sounds of distress for 15 minutes, but neither of them goes and checks it out. Betsy and Jason were fond, courting, often together. Isaac Whiting, a friend of Jason's. Last December, Jason mentioned difficulty courting Betsy as her friends are against him. He didn't think he would ever get to marry her because of difficulties between the families. And Jason joked about, or talked, but Isaac felt it was joking, about sacrificing her character but not wanting to hurt her. Abner Whiting. Now, the last one was Isaac Whiting. Uh, we don't know if he disagrees with the rest of his family or if he's a different Whiting, because from now on, all of the Whitings are super against Jason. Uh, and the Whiting family at this time is very up and coming. Uh, they were probably a bit jealous of the Fairbanks stature in the town and may have had ulterior motives in seeing the Fairbanks family fall from grace. Two to three years ago, in Mr. Bates's shop with Jason, J Mrs. Fales walks by, Jason curses and swore he would have satisfaction of her. And then Abner says, well, and Bates told me that Jason went home with Betsy one night and the door was shut against him. So, and that's why Jason believed he wasn't allowed at the Fales house. Bates is dead at this time, he can't testify. Because again, this happened a few years earlier. Next time, Abner's in Bates' shop at the same time as Jason, and Betsy walks by, and Abner asks Jason about his previous comments, and Jason says he never meant it. And then later on, he's asked again, oh, and then there was a time when I was at Bates' shop, and Jason was there, and we saw this person walk by. And basically, according to Abner, any time Jason has ever been out of his house, Abner somehow was there and knew what he said. But <clears throat> anyway, R. Farrington, don't know her first name. Betsy and Jason often walked home together. Jason said he was going to meet Betsy, violate her chastity, or carry her to Rentham. But it wasn't serious. They often joked about, you know, sex and girls and the things young men are wont to joke about in that time period and in this time period, whether it's appropriate or not. <laughs> I could go into a whole topic about my boys will be boys opinions, but that's fine. Monday morning, they talk. Jason says he will meet Farrington an hour later after he's going to meet Betsy to tell him how it goes. Eliza Guild. Jason and Betsy were close. She encouraged Jason to not despair over his health so he could take Betsy to the ball. Jason expresses to several people that he fears he won't live another three or four months because he's been very especially sickly and ill recently. Um, in fact, about four months before the day Elizabeth dies, um, he had had a terrible, he'd come down with a terrible illness, he was in bed for days, um, he was coughing up blood, we know now it was probably tuberculosis, um, but so he was always sickly, but he had been especially ill recently. <coughs> Jason was no more attentive to Betsy than any other girl. So you see, it's a lot of, it's so much is contradictory. So now we go to the defense witnesses. Betsy's brother. I don't recall Abner Whiting ever mentioning any of Jason's threats toward my family. So the first defense witness is basically like, I don't know what Abner's talking about. He confirms Abner's a man of truth, but has had issues with lawsuits and bad luck. So a great part of the defense's strategy is discrediting Abner Whiting, because again, Abner Whiting has the most damning testimony that Jason was threatening the Thales family and wanted to do them harm. And they're saying Abner doesn't know what he's talking about. Dr. Charles Kittredge lists Jason's wounds, because remember, when he showed up at the Fales house, he was gravely injured as well. He had a large wound on his throat, which was also a cut across the throat, but not nearly as deep as Elizabeth's, did not cut into the windpipe. Three in his chest, three in his abdomen, one was very deep, three shallow on the right side, one in right arm, three in left thigh. So the abdominal wound mortified, it means it got infected. He brought on lockjaw. He had a fever for eight days. Dr. Kittredge did not think Jason would survive. Jason came very, very close to dying before this trial could ever even happen. Um, while Jason was insensible with fever, he was at the Fales house the whole time because he couldn't be moved. So basically he gets to the Fales house. He says, Betsy's in the field and needs help and collapses. 
and from then on he's so ill he can't be moved without killing him. So for over a week after their daughter's death, and they're quite convinced he did it, uh, Jason is living at their house recuperating. So there's no documentation of how anyone felt about that, but I have to imagine it wasn't comfortable. <clears throat> Eunice Lewis. She says, Dr. Kittredge, oh, Dr. Kittredge had, was told there was a wound on Betsy's back, had wanted to see it, had asked Mrs. Lewis who was looking after the body. Mrs. Lewis says no. And I will say, keep in mind, all of these arguments on where was the wound and this and that, the murder, allegedly, happened in May. The trial happens in August. So her body has long been buried. This happens much later than there's no forensic evidence. There's no photographs. So keep that in mind. It's all witness testimony. So she says, yes, I did not let Dr. Kitcher see the wound. Lydia Whiting, sister of Abner, Dr. Kittredge saw the back wound. He stooped down to examine it closely and said, it is the greatest evidence against him. Catherine Everett says, oh yeah, but Lydia said, definitely. <laughs> Reuben Farrington, got, Dr. Kittredge said he wanted to see the back wound, wasn't able to, expressed regret. Ebenezer Fairbanks Jr., Dr. Kittredge and I were with Jason, not present with the jury at Betsy's examination. So they said when her body was being looked after by Mrs. Lewis, he couldn't see it. When the jury got to look at the body, he was not present. Edward Sisk confirms Dr. Kittredge didn't see the wound. Suki Fairbanks confirms that Jason and Betsy were very tender with each other. They were intimate. They were very close. And that they were together alone for a night. And that the next morning, Betsy told Suki, oh, I have to tell you something. But her sister, Polly Fails, Elizabeth's sister, was present and sleeping, but Elizabeth was afraid she wasn't actually asleep. So she never told Suki what she wanted to say, but this was after she had spent a night alone with Jason. Uh, and Suki also confirms, Jason's very weak and sickly. We tussled once and I held him easily. It took him hours to recover. He is not, I mean, he is not a well young man. He is not strong. Ebenezer Fairbanks Jr. is called again. Jason was very weak, unable to work, especially since this illness several months ago. He needed help even dressing and undressing. Jason and Betsy were fond as far as he knew, but he didn't talk to his older brother about feelings. He wasn't sure. And Jason wrote music on Monday morning, and that is why he needed the pen. He had the pen knife uh, for a legitimate reason. He borrowed the pen knife saying, I want to make a pen. He did, in fact, make a pen and use it that morning. Betsy's father says, I never refused Jason from my house. Jason's uncle says something, but I don't remember what. The play wasn't important. <laughs> William Draper. Yeah, Abner Whiting had issues. He was troubled in his mind eight or nine years ago. Uh, and in fact, just this week before the trial, he told me he had said something wrong before the grand jury and thought he might get in trouble. So again, a big part of the prosecution's most damning evidence was Abner saying Jason had threatened the family. And a big part of the defense was them saying Abner is lying or possibly just crazy. Dr. Metcalf, Jason almost didn't survive his wounds and at one point said he didn't want to because his friend was dead. And Betsy definitely had a wound on her left thumb, by the way. Mary Whiting, Dr. and this is, I believe, uh, Abner's mother. Dr. Kittredge said the back wound was the greatest evidence against him. Uh, oddly enough, her wording is suspiciously similar to Abner's sister's wording. And again, neither of them were, uh, after this, I know the next bullet point is her saying, uh, no, I, I never actually saw him see the wound. I just, I just know he did. <laughs> Defense's closing statement. He gives a, uh, they give a stirring speech about the juror's obligation to discount rumor and the exaggeration that often accompanies a case where emotions run high. They said Jason had no motive to kill Betsy. He loved her. They offer a more likely scenario. A relationship like a smothered flame leads Betsy to self-harm. To quote them, is it not more likely that a passionate young woman harms herself in grief at the impossibility of them being together than that a sickly but devoted young man kills the object of his love? And then this is a quotation, direct quotation. If he was the murderer, he was neither impelled by anger, by jealousy, by avarice, or by lust, 
Not an angry word had escaped the lips of either of them. So basically, they also say if Jason was planning this, he would not have told people he was going to meet Betsy. His talk of gratifying desires was obviously bluster. He'd had plenty of time alone with Betsy over the past two to three years. If he was going to violate her chastity, he could have already done so. And the testimony of threats made is months, years old, and only shows how deeply he grieved at not being approved for Betsy. Abner's testimony is confused and contradictory. If it was true, why didn't Abner say something then? So basically, the stuff Abner's saying happened ages ago. It was all bluster. It was just him expressing how distraught he was. And besides, Abner is not trustworthy anyway. If this was planned, Jason had access to much better weapons than a small broken penknife. Even Dr. Ames, who was publicly not a fan of the Fairbankses, agreed that the back wound could have been self-inflicted. Uh, and that is something that's interesting. A lot of what we know about Dedham history from around this time is from the diary of Nathaniel Ames. He kept an incredibly detailed diary of who was born, who died, what they died of, the daily weather, anything happening in town, all this stuff. I mean, he kept track of everything. But when it comes to the Fairbanks, pretty much like Fairbanks was there today. Ugh. Like, I mean, he's just, he's not a fan of the Fairbanks at all. <clears throat> the majority of Betsy's wounds were on her left side. Jason does not have use of his right arm at all. So, Betsy is right-handed. It's much more likely she did her own injuries to her left side with her right hand than Jason facing her. It would be on, it, he wouldn't be able to do that. <clears throat> the wide variety of wounds may seem strange that they're all over the place, but Jason had a similar variety of wounds and those were definitely self-inflicted. No one disagrees with that. So they're saying, you know, yeah, it's weird that she had chest wounds and throat and stomach and back and big Jason had wounds all over also. If the cries of distress, the cries of distress that were overheard were obviously emotional rather than physical. Because if you are in physical pain, you say something stronger than, oh dear, oh dear. Which is true, honestly. I mean, I, if I was being stabbed, I would have much stronger words to say. <clears throat> And again, they went on for 15 minutes without the girls coming to investigate, which suggests that even if there were cries of distress, they clearly weren't blood-curdling screams, or else the girls would have gone and checked it out. The false certificate was totally innocent, as uh, you know, Suki has shown us. It was shown to Betsy in jest. Betsy would have known it was a fake because she lived in Dedham. If there had been something from the town clerk published saying they were to be married, she would have seen it in the newspaper. Uh, Jason showed it to Betsy, saying that the forgery was as close as they would get to ever being married, and that it grieved him so that that was the closest as they could have. Now, my next one that I really love, I think this is fantastic logic. Murder is not usually committed in the countryside midday in sunshine. Guilt invariably shuns the light. <laughs> Part of the defense statement, and believe me, the, the, the prosecution has a good one later on, too, uh, that clearly he couldn't have killed her because you don't murder people in daytime, obviously. <laughs> Everyone knows that. That's <laughs> just how it is. And it was unlikely for Jason to murder Betsy in an open pasture within view of her father's house. The penknife is small enough, it's only two and a half inches long with a broken tip, that mortal wounds would require either massive strength which Jason did not have, far from it, she was stronger than him, or cooperation of the victim. And that if they supposedly struggled for 15 minutes while these cries of distress were heard, how could the weak Jason have held on to her that whole time? If Jason was somehow able to hold her for 15 minutes and somehow had the strength to make all these wounds on her, then why isn't, and if, and if Jason was trying to violate her chastity, why is all of her clothing still fine except for the stab wounds? Her shoes and her shawl are on the ground nearby, but the rest of her clothes are fine. Again, aside from holes from being stabbed. His own suicide attempt shows his innocence. If he was guilty, he would have dumped the knife and run, not gone to the Fales house. He has always been weak, especially after illness four months ago, where he was coughing blood. Just ten days before this incident, he lost a tussle with a four-year-old relative. <laughs> I can't imagine that he probably was happy that story got shared, but... <laughs> And the many inconsistencies and in testimonies should cause great doubt. So they're saying there is reasonable doubt here. There's enough inconsistencies in these testimonies 
there's doubt. The prosecution, their closing statement. Jason had the knife, was the only person in the meadow with Betsy. She has no reason to kill herself. If she wanted to marry Jason, she could have. If she were to commit suicide, and this is their version of the ridiculous statement, if she were to commit suicide, it would not be like this. When it comes to women, it is always preceded by melancholy, and women generally, quote, avoid the ghastly wounds of the knife and death. So according to the prosecution, uh, if a woman is not sad, she will not commit suicide, and that women will use, you know, poison or strangling. They don't use knives and daggers. It's far too bloody. That's actually true. It's, it is, statistically, it's true. I'm not sure it's, you know, evidence enough for a court case about murder, but, you know, fine. Betsy was virtuous. She probably died in defense of her honor. And she couldn't have given herself these wounds. She wouldn't cut her own thumb. Not sure which thumb, he doesn't say, because who knows. Or the tendons in her arm, which is a good point. The Attorney General goes on at length. This is when he gets a little pompous and really shows how much he loves his own voice. He goes on length regarding the state of education in our country, the idleness of the children, the path of life. I mean, he goes on for pages. It was beautifully written and really not anything to do with the entire case other than, like, part of what's wrong with Jason is product of his times, I guess. Perhaps Jason didn't go in planning to murder her, but he did intend to have his way with her. And when she tore the fake certificate, it drove him to rage. His infirmity is not an issue. He used his good hand to stab her in the back. Then as she turned around, he stabbed at her chest and throat. She puts up her arms to defend herself. And that's when her arms get the wounds. So again, perfectly possible if she turned away from him for some reason, he could have used his good arm. Um, but it wouldn't have been a 15 minute tussle. Perhaps there was a suicide pact. The defense stated this. They thought that there may have been, and they put this forward, this was one of the things circulating for the general public, that the two of them had made a suicide pact out of love, a star-crossed lovers like Romeo and Juliet. Um, and this is suggested by the defense counsel. Jason never says this, and he in fact denies it till the end. But the prosecution says, well, maybe there was, but even if there was, he'd still be culpable, because he got her to agree to it, and he provided the weapon. If it was self-inflicted harm, was Jason just standing there the whole time? It's another good point. If Betsy did all this to herself, what was Jason doing? While she, was he standing there while she stabbed herself repeatedly? She had no motive to kill herself. His inability to labor, unexcitement about the arts and sciences, and overindulgence of his parents made him weak in character and unable to stop negative inclinations and I think something about obstinacy. So he's, this is the attorney general, is just, you know, Jason's just a bad character all around. Jason wanted to ruin Betsy's parents by ruining her. She would not have agreed to this, so he must have planned on raping her. And going to the Fales house instead of running away is not proof of innocence, as the defense claimed. He knew there were witnesses who could place him in the meadow, and he knew running would make him look guilty. Maybe he intended to kill himself, or perhaps he just wounded himself enough to substantiate his story, which is belied by how close he came to dying, but... If it was an actual suicide attempt, it is only because of his guilt. So if Jason did try to kill himself, it's only because he felt bad for what he had done. And then he goes on to tell the jurors that even when evidence seems circumstantial, it isn't always. As witnesses must be taken to their word and feeling experience must be taken into account. Basically saying, if there's enough circumstantial evidence, it counts as real evidence, basically. Much circumstantial evidence may be seen as fact. He gives an example, actually he gives a few examples, but this is the most clear one, is that if a man fires a gun and another man standing nearby dies of a gunshot wound right then, then it's circumstantial because they, in 1801, had no way to prove, you know, they didn't have ballistics, they couldn't prove where, what gun the bullet came from. Perhaps there was someone standing off that no one could see, and he shot the man who died. So he's saying it's circumstantial that this man shot this other man. But that if a man shoots a gun and another man dies right there, you can say it's proof that that man shot him. So the final results. Despite the differences in testimonies and the craziness, the jury only deliberates for two to three hours. It's one hour at night after testimony closes, 
and then a short time the following morning. The verdict of guilty is unanimous. Ebenezer Jr. claims that within a few days after this, several jurors had spoken up saying, well, maybe they weren't so sure and they felt like they'd been pressured. But other than Ebenezer Jr.'s word, we don't really have any proof of that. The judge sentences Jason to death by hanging. <clears throat> but that's not the end of the tale. Because the night of August 17th, Jason escapes from Dedham Prison with his help of his brother Ebenezer and a few of his friends. A flyer is put out the next day. The stain of blood is upon the land. Jason Fairbanks, the murderer, has escaped. We cannot tell where to look for him. We must look everywhere. Therefore, we agree and submit to three things. That our houses and premises shall be searched. That we will give an account of ourselves and our inmates during the night past and this day. That we will exert ourselves in every way to apprehend the culprit and his accomplices. No honest man's eyes must sleep in Dedham this night. <laughs> An enormous bounty is put out. Sheriff Cutler of Dedham puts a $500 reward. This is 1801. That is a massive amount of money. And then subscriptions are raised in Boston. Basically, they go to the wealthy of Boston and they're like, there's a murderer on the streets. Don't you want to help catch him? And they get donations to bring the reward up to $1,000. Again, 1801. That is a massive amount of money. Probably one of the largest bounties that had been seen. Now keep in mind at this time, the Jason Fairbanks trial was the O.J. Simpson trial of his day. Everyone knew about this. It was in all the papers. The streets outside the courthouse were thronged with people. I believe actually they had to leave the courthouse and go to the meeting house at one point just because there were so many people trying to fit in the room. So this is a big deal. This isn't just a denim thing. Everyone in New England knows about this. So, and again, it also, I'm sure part of Sheriff Cutler, I mean, I'm sure it probably wasn't 500 of his personal dollars, but he certainly had a vested interest in catching Jason, because it does not look good for the sheriff to have let a murderer escape who is nationally known. Jason and Henry Dukem head west and then north through Vermont to Lake Champlain. On Sunday, August 23rd, between 8 and 9 a.m., they are apprehended by Captain Henry Tisdale of Dover, Mr. Moses P. Holt of Hadley, and Mr. Seth Wheelock of Medfield. When the hunters catch up to Jason, he is eating breakfast while preparing to get on board a boat. Uh, Dukem uh, chartered a boat for $15 that was going to take Jason to Canada. And once he was in Canada, Jason would have been home free. So he's literally, the, his bags were already on board, they were getting ready to cast off, he was grabbing a bite to eat while the crew of the ship gets ready. He's literally minutes from getting on the boat that will take him to Canada when the bounty hunters catch up with him. <clears throat> Jason and Dukem were brought to, the, brought to the Jenham jail and both offered no resistance. Now, it's noted that Jason appeared uncaring or insensible when they caught up with him, the bounty hunters, on the shores of Lake Champlain. Some said it was that he was uncaring, some said it was that he was confused or insensible. Again, the stories differ. But he offers no resistance and is brought back to the Boston jail because obviously the Denham jail was not secure enough. <laughs> um, and, and it is said, you know, people who traveled with them said he was just oddly confused the whole time. And that when the bounty hunters caught up to him, he expressed surprise that they had come so far to catch him. Basically, they'd pursued him for so far, for so long, which was, I mean, everyone knew about this. Maybe he was unaware of how big the trial was, but it's <clears throat> weird. The governor issues a warrant for Jason's execution to be on Thursday, September 10th, between 11 and 3. A later investigation shows the people involved in breaking Jason out of jail were his brother Ebenezer, David Sisk, Nathaniel Davis, Isaac Whiting, and Reuben Farrington. Isaac Whiting and Ruben Farrington were both uh, witnesses for the defense during the trial. They were friends of Jason's. Farrington and Whiting are later acquitted. Uh, Davis is sentenced to two months in jail. Sisk and Ebenezer Fairbanks Jr. get four months in jail. We're not told when they served those four months, but Ebenezer Fairbanks Jr. served four months in jail at some point. So, this is a current map of debt. So this is, you know, Denham Square Coffee House and the Blue Bunny. 
Uh, this is, you know, the stop at the Bedetta Mall. <laughs> Fairbanks House is just over here. Uh, we're somewhere around here, I think. The Dedham, the town common, and it's called the common because it was common property, everyone could go there to graze their sheep and their cows and their goats. And the town common, it's still called the Dedham Commons, it was much larger, but if you go up High Street, there's a triangle with nothing built in it. And that is the Dedham Common, that's where it was then, and that is where Jason's execution takes place. Oh. He walks from Boston to Dedham, accompanied by Reverend Dr. Thatcher. Now, Dr. Thatcher, the Reverend, uh, visits Jason a great deal when he's in prison, um, encourages him to find peace with God and to beg for forgiveness for his sins. Um, but he says Jason never changed his story the whole time and that he was always a little off. He's escorted by the Sheriff of Suffolk to the county line, where the Sheriff of Norfolk is waiting with the Roxbury Troop of Horse. So this is, I mean, they, they, this is handing over a prisoner, like maximum security style for 1801. He's brought to the Dedham jail and searched. A knife is found on him, which he admits was given to him to end his own life. But we don't know why he didn't use it or why, who gave it to him. He's escorted to the town common by a hundred volunteer guardsmen, guards people. The population in debt of Dedham in 1801 is 2,000. 10,000 people show up for the execution. They counted something like 1,200 horses and uh, horse-drawn carriages coming down through High Street that that same day. So I mean, this is a massive amount. I mean, it was they had something like it was a hundred guardsmen of like 300 Dedham citizens who volunteered to be guardsmen. And it turns out it's a good thing they only needed a hundred to escort Jason because they needed the other ones for crowd control. This was massive. Anyone who could get to Dedham on that day in September 1801 went to Dedham. On the way to the green, and once he was there, it was noted by many, Jason seemed uncaring or insensible again, that he was just a little off, it was kind of like, oh, sure, you know, he walks there, apparently, a couple times in the walk, he'd say, oh, is, oh, is that so-and-so? Oh, you know, he would, like, people he recognized in the distance. Just before 3 p.m., Jason was asked, do you have any final words? No. He was to give a signal when he was ready. The sheriff gave him a handkerchief, and when he was ready to be hanged, he was supposed to throw the handkerchief down. Pretty much as soon as the sheriff gives it to him, Jason's like, yep, done. I mean, he was, he was ready. He says, you know, that he was, whatever, however insensible he may have been, he was, you know, he knew this was going to happen and there was no getting out of it. He basically was just like, we're here, we're doing it. He died by hanging. He was buried in the family plot in Dedham, uh, the old town, town cemetery that's behind St. Paul's. Um, yeah, I don't know what direction I'm at with that. That way, that way. <laughs> Um, and he's buried only a few rows away from Elizabeth Fales, which, so yeah, they're in their gravestones are still there. They were buried quite close to each other. Jason dictated a declaration to his jailers to be read after his death, because remember, he never got to testify at his trial. So this is Jason's account of what happened. I met Elizabeth Fales at an early age, eventually paid my address, and was received as a favored lover for a year in harmony with her family. One night, I made a tasteless joke, which offended her sister Clarissa, who then turned Betsy's parents against me. Apparently, they're all hanging out at the Fales house one night, and Clarissa says, oh, when it, it, is so-and-so coming over? And Jason says, you know, oh, I knew so-and-so was coming over because you went and got that bottle of brandy earlier. So he, he made a joke about someone Clarissa liked being too into his drink. Um, and then basically he says that this one tasteless joke alienates me from her entire family, which is, is ridiculous. I meant it jestingly, I apologized afterward, but no, her entire family hated me from then on because of this one joke. I never did anything else to them. Later, someone in Dedham published a piece ridiculing Mrs. Fales and Clarissa, and while I said I would purchase it, the person actually came up and said, hey, if I wrote something making fun of them, would you buy it? And he said, yeah, I'd pay a few pence for that. I was in no way involved with its creation or publication, despite the rumors and Mrs. Fales and Clarissa always believing it, believing that Jason had to do with this being published. <clears throat> Betsy and I separated for a year, hoping the enmity would die down, but it didn't. Betsy admitted she was still in love with me, and we resumed our relationship, though she said she could not invite me to her father's house, and we would have to meet elsewhere. So that's where he gets the impression he's not allowed 
at the father's, at the Fails house. We saw each other often, outdoors, until the weather grew bad, and then at friends' houses. And again, during the trial, several different friends have vouched that they spent time together at friends' houses. When I was ill, she would come stay at my house with me. Just the Wednesday before her death, she stayed the night and said how much she wished we could be married, and we agreed to meet Monday afternoon. There was never a suicide pact. We met for conversation. We talked about the subject of our marriage, and it occurred to me I had the certificate written by my niece. And it occurred to you? You just got it the night before. That seems a little disingenuous, but fine. Jason then relates the exact same story Suki said that he wanted her to write something just because she worked for the town's clerk's office. He said, oh yeah, show me, show me you do your job, write something. And she said, oh, whose name should I put in? And he said, oh, any of the dead of girls. And she said, huh, how about Betsy? And he said, oh, Betsy, that'll do. So same story as Suki. I read it to Betsy saying I feared this was as close to marriage as we would get and then tore it up, telling her I wished to be married in truth. I asked her to go away with me then to be married, but that she would return to her father's house because I could not support her. So basically he's saying, okay, let's go get married right now so we'll be man and wife and your family can't do anything about it, but you know, we can't live together yet. You have to go back to your dad's house tonight because I can't, I don't, I can't support you. He didn't have a uh, regular job at the time. He couldn't do labor. She cried saying she would be disowned and shamed and that I could not love her and spoke of how often her sisters and Mrs. Whiting told her I did not truly love her. The Whitings are clearly, they've got it out for the Fairbanks in a lot of ways. I feel terrible about it now, but I said that if she wants to believe Mrs. Whiting and her sisters, she can go to the devil with them. Which, go to the devil with you, was actually a pretty severe curse at the time. Since she knew I had already, quote, possessed her person and received the pledge of her most tender affections. So unless he's stretching things quite a lot, Jason's claiming they already had sex. Which kind of takes the whole chastity argument out of the equation. She demanded to know if I told anyone of our relationship, and I admitted I had told a couple of my dearest friends. She said I was a monster. This suggests, yeah, they did have sex, because if she was just talking, if she was just saying, oh, have you told any of your friends who are seeing each other? Everyone knew. They all testified. They saw them together all the time. It's more likely she was saying, did you tell your friends we had sex? And he said, oh, I only told a couple of my friends, and she's horrified that Jason is told. So that seems to be, that seems to suggest that that's her... Uh, suggests to me that she's confirming they have had sex at that time. During our conversation, I had been whittling a small piece of wood with a pen knife. She cried, give me that knife, I will put an end to my existence, you false-hearted man, for I had rather die than live. She grabbed the knife and began randomly stabbing herself while walking away from me. I was struck with astonishment and frozen in a state of insensibility, but I was startled back to awareness when she came back over and almost fell on me. I saw then that she had cut her throat. I immediately grabbed the knife and stabbed myself repeatedly and cut my own throat, <laughs> intending to end my own life. So he says, basically, she starts wounding herself and he freezes up like, oh my God, what are you doing? And then when he snaps out of it because she comes back over to him, he's like, oh my God, what have you done? And he feels badly because, I mean, first of all, she knows she's going to die and he loves her or because he feels like he drove her to do this by telling his friends about their relationship or the, how deep their relationship is. So he tries to end himself in repentance, in sadness, whatever. This is a copy of the statement Jason dictated to his jailer. Uh, it's hanging in the office at the Fairbanks house. It is the original. Um, it's at the, excuse me, it's in the offices of the Fairbanks house, not the Fairbanks house itself. It's upstairs in collections. Um, hangs right over Dan the Curator's desk. Um, for, I guess, when he wants to be cheered up? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Thus have I, in my last week state, given a true and faithful account of all these affecting circumstances, which have brought my youth to its most unhappy downfall. It is my remaining hope that the view of my sad destiny may prove a warning to all young people, and likewise to every parent, not to ruin themselves and destroy their children for the sake of of mere self-gratification. So unless I'm reading this wrong, his last words are basically like, Mr. and Mrs. Fails, this is your fault. If you hadn't made Betsy feel bad about me, none of this would have happened. It's basically, he's basically his last words. So. <clears throat> the trial remains major news for months. 
a publication of the court transcripts. This, in fact, publication, the first part of this book, goes through four editions in four months, and thousands of copies are sold. I mean, this is massive. Everyone wants to read the court transcript of the trial of Jason Fairbanks. Ebenezer Jr. spends the rest of his life, and pretty much all of his money, self-publishing essays and trying to convince the public of his late brother's innocence and repair his tarnished character. So again, he doesn't want to just convince people that his brother didn't murder Elizabeth. He wants to convince people because now everyone's saying, oh, not only is he a murderer, he didn't work, he was a lazy layabout, he was weak. You know, he's saying no, he had a, he had a weak constitution, but he was a good man, he was beloved to our family, he wanted to work and couldn't, and in fact would, would even work when I told him not to, to the point when it made him sicker because he felt so bad that he couldn't be more productive. So Ebenezer Jr. publishes a lot trying to do this. Jason's already been tried and convicted in the court of public opinion. Ebenezer's efforts don't make a difference. And for a couple centuries, Jason's known as the murderer of Elizabeth. So the whole Fairbanks family reputation suffers. Obviously, when you have a convicted murderer in the family, it doesn't look good. And again, Ebenezer's spending all of his time trying to prove Jason's innocent when no one believes it. Ebenezer Jr.'s daughters who do get married find spouses who do not live in Denham. No one gets married in Denham from the Fairbanks family in that generation. Three daughters remain unmarried because there's no dowry and the family reputation is in tatters. And the main, the family fortune is completely lost. Now, it's not only because of him self-publishing all the stuff about Jason, he also made some bad farming decisions and just wasn't great with money overall. He went too far into debt and then obviously with the family reputation in tatters, had no way of recouping that debt. But for a couple of reasons, and certainly this was a major part of it, they lose all of their fortune. Historically, this ends up being a good thing because this is why the house is pretty much unchanged from 1801. The late 1800s, the Victorian era, is when a vast amount of history is lost because Victorians are all about bigger, better, upgrading. Victorians even love to put historic looking things in houses and then claim they were ancient history when they really aren't. The Victorians are the worst things that ever happened to history. All right, it's just in this term. But while everyone is in the Victorian era, you know, upgrading and oh, this newfangled plumbing, you know, we have an indoor, an indoor, you know, washing space and, you know, oh, we'll add another, you know, we'll make our windows much bigger and we'll add this wood burning stove and this and that. And the Fairbanks sisters were able to do a couple of those things. They added a wood burning stove that was later taken out in the house and made a museum. But the major changes that most people made to their houses, they could not afford to. And even after the three sisters, it goes to their niece, Rebecca, and the sisters pretty much live by selling off land. Ebenezer Jr. dies in a lot of debt, but he has almost 400 acres of property. The three sisters live by selling off land. By the time Rebecca gets the property, there's only a couple acres left. The property is actually smaller than it is today. And she survives by selling off a lot of the family heirlooms, which is sad, but she had to survive somehow. Um, because the family is still suffering 100 years later from their reputation still suffers because of Jason. Uh, so again, it was terrible for them, and I feel very badly for Rebecca at 84 years old, living in a house with no heat, no electricity, no plumbing. But when it comes to historic house museums, we're unique because most places did not last that long without being changed. Now, the final question. Obviously, the final question is, did he really do it? And it seems to me, people say, do you think he did it? Do I think he did it? Probably. It seems the most logical, but there's some doubt. There was enough differences in testimony. There was enough confusion and contradictory stories that I don't think he would have been convicted today because I think there was some doubt. And again, I mean, today it wouldn't be the same because now we have forensics and ballistics and, well, not ballistics, they have guns, but forensics. And, but back then it was all eyewitness. It was all hearsay and people remembering things. So I think he did do it, but I, not, I'm not sure about it, the way that media seems to be. But I think that he did it for a different reason. He didn't do it because she wouldn't agree to go get married. I think he did it because he was sick. A theory originally put forth by Dale H. Freeman suggests Jason suffered from mercury poisoning. Now, symptoms of mercury poisoning include 
weakness, um, common, you know, being ill often, a lot of things that match this diagnosis. A mercury poisoning can evidence itself by the person being kind of dazed or confused a lot. The insensibility they talk about when Jason is brought back to Dedham after trying to run away. A lot of the stuff matches up. Another possible symptom of mercury poisoning is sudden rages and memory blackouts. Could mercury poisoning have, poisoning have put him in an adrenaline-fueled rage enough to actually be able to hurt this girl, mortally wound this girl who was much stronger than him? I don't know. But it's the only other possibility we can come up with. Because we know no one else was in the, was in the meadow, and we're not really sure what else could have happened. So either she did it herself, he did it to her, or he did it to her and maybe actually didn't remember. We don't know. Jason had never been reported to have these behaviors, the blackouts and the rages, but again, they are known side effects now we know of mercury poisoning. So despite there existing some measure of doubt in Ebenezer Jr.'s efforts, Jason remained guilty in the public eye for centuries. And even today, Google search results find all articles and sources listing him as a murderer, saying he did it, the word alleged is never seen. Now, in all fairness, he was convicted of it, so I think technically you only say alleged when they haven't been convicted yet, but I still feel like no one gives him a fair enough, no one mentions all the doubts and inconsistencies. It's just like, oh yeah, obviously in 1801, Jason murdered Eliza, Elizabeth. So, that is the story of Jason Fairbanks and the sad story of Elizabeth Fails, and whether he did it or she did it or he did it unknowingly is something you will have to decide for yourselves. So. <laughs> Thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, we've got the Fairbanks Fall Festival. Um, we've got the next talk will be the first Thursday of October, and Dan will be talking about witches, demons, and superstitions. Uh, along, so the things that the Fairbanks house, the Fairbanks family members believed, and also some new hex marks and things he's found in the Fairbanks house uh, that showed their superstitions. Saturday, October 12th, s'mores and stories. Feel free to give contact me if you have any questions. Um, and don't forget to sign up for Ghost Tours soon if you're interested in them. And thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.